On the gentle slopes of the Messines Ridge lies a small wood which faces the city of Ypres. Here in 1914, a Bavarian soldier carried messages to and from the front line. A generation later, he would return as his army stamped their way across Europe. This week, we're back in Flanders. Welcome to the old front line. Once more, we find ourselves in Flanders fields, and we're starting this week southwest of Ypres, on the southern outskirts of the village of Vormazila. This was a village that was just behind the British front line for most of the war. Regular soldiers, old contemptibles, marched through it on their way to the front during the first Battle of Ypres in 1914. When the front lines were established at the end of that battle and trench warfare began, men came through here en route to the front line at saint Loire or around the village of Wichater, or White Sheet, as they called it. Just like us, the British Tommy of the Great War could not pronounce many of these foreign names, particularly here in Flanders, and he corrupted them. In White Sheet, sitting high on the Messines Ridge, was the dominant village on this part of the battlefield. And as we start on a road junction near a wayside cavalry on the southern edge of Vormazila village, we can see the top of the spire of Wichata White Sheet Church just above the trees in the distance. Behind us is the village of Vormazila itself. By 1916, where we are now, was a route to the front line. The communication trenches ran through here. The village of Vormazila, damaged by shell fire, was nevertheless intact. Some of its buildings were still used as billets, particularly the cellars of some of the bigger houses in Vormazila. And there were advanced headquarters here, and also medical facilities. There are several cemeteries within Vormazila called Vormazila Enclosure Cemeteries, and these contain many of the dead from this sector of the battlefield. We're at a fork in the road here, and if we took the right-hand fork, that would take us onto the main Ypres-Kemmel Road near to Veerstraat. We're going to take the left-hand road and walk up towards the Messines Ridge we can see stretching off in the distance ahead of us. We'll continue down this road and past the modern farm on the left-hand side until we reach a little bridge over a stream, a beak that runs here. And we'll stop and look up to the Messines Ridge and the trees ahead of us. The trees of what is marked on British maps as Krunart wood or on German maps as Bayenwald, Bavarian wood. Because for a big chunk of the war, troops from the Bavarian Army Corps, Bavarian units, served in this part of the Ypres salient. Where we are now is behind the British front line. We're roughly in the British second line positions here. So the British front line was just ahead of us. The ground slopes gently upwards here and there's a break in the field between the field to our left and the next one and just beyond that is roughly where the British front line was located. On the high ground ahead where we see the trees were the German positions. Their front line was in the field, and behind them was the wood, Krunart Wood, or Banwald to them. And there was their second line positions that guarded this area of the battlefield and its approaches to the village of Wichata. This part of the front was formed at the end of the first Battle of Ypres in October and November of 1914, when some British units fought in this area, but largely French ones, French Poilus. We often forget that the French were very heavily involved in the first Battle of Ypres, and indeed many of the others. And here in 1914 it was French units, many of them territorials, that clashed with the German units in this area of the Messines Ridge. The Germans pushed both British and French troops back off the ridge and took that ridge at the end of the First Battle of Ypres. And for them in this southern sector, they now dominated the battlefield. They'd failed to break through in their race to the sea. They were not going to get to the Channel ports. But here they commanded this part of the battlefield from the so-called high point of the Messines Ridge. I'm only talking about a ridge that was tens of metres above sea level. But here, on the flat Flanders landscape, that affords you an advantage. The first attempt to try and break the stalemate of these trenches took place just beyond Wichata in December of 1914 when British units attacked that part of the Messines Ridge. Moving forward across no man's land, exposed in the open, 
barely protected by their artillery, the outcome would begin the familiar echoes of what would happen in the year to come as both sides came to terms with what trench warfare, attritional trench warfare meant on the Western Front. That British attack failed with heavy losses and it was quickly realised that the Messines Ridge could not be taken by a full frontal infantry assault, even with greater artillery. It would require more careful thinking. And that careful thinking came in 1916 when plans were made to utilise the tunnelling companies of the Royal Engineers to dig under the Messines Ridge and lay a series of charges from Hill 60 in the north to Plugstert or Plug Street in the south. Eventually, this became the Battle of Messines, fought here on the 7th of June 1917, when mines were blown just to the other side of where we are now, just across to our right at Holland Chassure Farm and over to our left in the village of saint eloi There were no mines on this front, although mining activity had taken place here during the quiet period. Where we are now was occupied by units of the 19th Western Division. This was a Kitchener's Army unit formed in 1914, come across to the Western Front in 1915, had taken part in the Battle of the Somme, and then moved up to Flanders. But by the time of the Battle of Messines, the composition of the men in the battalions that fought here had changed. There were still volunteers, but the majority were Lord Derby men, who joined up in that final phase of volunteering in 1915, or more likely, they were conscripts. By 1917, when the battle took place here, the army had changed forever. Because of conscription, its composition perhaps now reflected Britain in a much deeper and broader way than it had ever done before. Every type of man from every type of background was here and would take part in one of the most successful battles on the Western Front. These men may have been conscripts, but they were highly trained, and for this battle, the trained on models of the battlefield behind the lines, were shown maps, even platoon sergeants had maps in this battle. They knew what they were doing, they understood their orders, they knew the landscape, and they had trained for the eventuality time and time again. And all of this training, being taken into the plan, all of that came to a head on the 7th of June 1917, when under the direction of their commander, General Plumer, the mines were blown the infantry went into the assault protected by their barrage and the Messines Ridge was taken in a single day. On the ground where we're standing now, the 7th Battalion, the Law North Lancashire Regiment, the 7th King's Own Royal Lancaster Regiment, made their attack at zero hour, ten past three, on the 7th of June 1917, up the slopes and into the area around Croonart Wood. And we'll follow in their footsteps now and take this road up the hill and to the edge of the wood. As we came up the slope, we passed a monument on the right-hand side to a French officer and a sign for Croonart Chapel Commonwealth Wargrave Cemetery. We'll come back to those shortly, but we've come up here now to look at this from the German perspective. So if we turn around and look back, we're looking down towards the village of Vormazila, over to our right to the spires of Ypres, and here there's an information panel and a German panoramic photograph showing what the view from this position was like during the war. We can see that here, just tens of metres above sea level, we have total dominance of this landscape. We can see everywhere, into Eep, beyond Eep, down to the British front line, beyond that British front line, into the nearest village, Vormazila, behind their line. And it meant that if you were a German observer here during the war, you could see the movement of your enemy, the British, at every opportunity plot their movement, bring down shell fire, wipe out their troops. This is why the Germans were determined to hold on to the Messines Ridge and why the British were determined to throw them off. But before that battle with the British took place, the Bavarian units that were up on the ridge faced the French, as the French monument we've just seen clearly indicates. And one unit that was here in late 1914 was the 16th Bavarian Reserve Infantry Regiment and serving in its ranks was the Austrian-born Adolf Hitler. This is one of the places where Hitler fought during the Great War. His unit had taken part in some of the operations along the Menin Road in 1914 and once the war had gone static they moved here to the Messines Ridge, first around Krunart Wood or Bayenveld to them at Wichata and then later at Messines itself where they served until Hitler's regiment and Hitler with it moved across the border into France to spend over a year 
near the village of Frommel, where eventually they would face the Australians in 1916, and then Hitler would move down with them to the Somme to be wounded near Ligny Tilloy in October of that year. While Hitler was here at Bayenwald, he was a company runner, which meant he took messages from company headquarters back to battalion headquarters. This meant at this stage of the war, he was actually quite close to the front line and would often be in the forward positions. Later, when he was promoted to become a regimental runner, that took him away from the front. Hitler often later glossed over some of these details and exaggerated his role in the war and some of the things that he did. What we do know is that he was awarded an Iron Cross second class here. There are some stories of him going out to save a wounded soldier under fire, but it doesn't appear to be an award for a specific act of bravery. One German historian believes that because of Hitler's close proximity to both company and battalion headquarters, he was able to toady up to some of the officers there, and while there's no doubting that he displayed gallantry on the battlefields on several occasions, his role as a runner and his close proximity to the officers probably helped the award along a bit. Hitler survived his encounter with the French. It's said that one of his nicknames in the regiment was the Cockroach because he was unkillable despite the fact that he was wounded on several occasions in the war, and then he found himself opposite the British at Messines a few weeks later when they took over that sector. So the area that we're going to go into is a location in which Adolf Hitler fought, and he returned to the area not just with his triumphant armies during the Blitzkrieg in 1940, but as a battlefield tourist when he came round these sites following the fall of France and Belgium and the Netherlands. He came out to see the places where he'd fought, and he drove through Wichata en route to Messines, no doubt as a nod to the fact that he'd been here in that early fighting of 1914. Many people often ask when we come here with groups, what if Hitler had been killed here? Would the outcome of the 20th century have been different? Having ancestors that died in the Holocaust, I've often pondered on that myself, but I'm not keen on what ifs. And we know that Hitler's service, both here and elsewhere on the Western Front, and the outcome of the war in November 1918, when he sat on a hospital bed in Berlin as the armistice was signed and proclaimed that Germany would rise again, that would all lead to another conflict, another war, in many respects perhaps even more terrible than this one. But it's not really just Hitler that we've come to discuss here today. He's a bit player in all this. Many thousands of soldiers pass through here, all with their own story. And we've come to this wood for a number of reasons. When we stand here facing down towards Vormazila and turn round, we can see there's a modern house on the corner of this plot. This replaced an earlier building, that was once the entrance to a trench museum. We discussed Sanctuary Wood in a previous podcast episode, but Sanctuary Wood wasn't the only trench museum on the Western Front. And when I first came to Flanders in 1982, Croonart Wood, where we are now, was one of the places that we came to. It was a very different sort of experience then. The wood is now privately owned, there's shooting in it at different times of the year, but the tourist office in Kemmel allows access to a set of recreated trenches dug by archaeologists built around the site of original bunkers and mine shafts that exist within the wood. But when I first came here, this was a private museum run by André Beccar, the Meister, a man who really told the same story twice. But he opened up here an incredible museum of the First World War that had a profound effect on me as a student and gave one of my earliest glimpses into what actually walking through Great War trenches was like. So we'll turn around and we'll stop here, and we'll have an imagined visit to the museum that was, because Andre Beccar died in the mid-1980s. His museum literally fell apart, the trenches collapsed in on themselves, his collection was scattered, and that old part of the battlefields has gone forever, except in the memories of those who were there, and the occasional photograph, some of which I'll put up on the podcast website oldfrontline.co.uk but let's imagine that visit as you came to the entrance you came to his soldiers canteen a little wooden hut in which was his cafe and his museum and I say museum in, in a loose sense of the word because this was not an organised museum with information panels and maps it was a big heap and jumbled collection of great war artefacts when you paid your money to go in you were given a handful of shrapnel balls, and I still have them now in a little box. The first shrapnel balls I ever held in my hand. And for someone fascinated by the Great War, 
that tangible object was really quite incredible to behold. He kept them in a huge brass shell case that was about a metre and a half tall, filled to the brim with these shrapnel balls. But around you was just about every bit of equipment you could imagine, from helmets to gas masks to rifles to flare pistols. There was the remains of a demarcation stone that had been dragged in off the battlefields, some of those around Ypres and across the border in France had been damaged in the Second World War. Where this one came from, I never discovered. But he didn't mind you picking the objects up and looking at them. And again, as a young student, as a schoolboy, being able to touch Great War objects and look at them and ask questions about them, that was quite some experience. You could sit with him and have a drink. There was a fridge with cold Cokes in it and a regular pot of coffee on his old pot boiler stove. And a few times I came here in the winter and the fire was burning low, he would use original First World War cordite sticks or discs and chuck them into the fire, which would make the fire reverberate as the cordite took hold and the fire would relight. A rather nerve-wracking experience at times. Once you'd paid your money and got your ticket, and I still have a roll of the tickets that were given to me many years ago by somebody in Flanders, and I'll put a picture of those up on the podcast website. You took your ticket and you entered the wood. And you walked past his front window. And in the front window on the right was a display of German Pickelhauber, the spiked helmets. The first time I didn't really notice what the Pickelhaubers were on. But then on a subsequent visit, I did. They were all placed on human skulls. The skulls of German soldiers recovered from the wood. I went there with someone who noticed this. And he picked up Andre Becker on this fact, who remarked, they're just Germans. That attitude is hard for us in the modern world to understand. But he was a Belgian who had lived through one world war, and his parents had experienced both. But I like to think that this was just another of his exaggerated stories, and these weren't really human skulls at all. And if they were, then when the museum eventually closed, these anonymous Fritz were eventually given a final resting place in Flanders fields. As you came into the woods, there was a big pile of shells piled up to make an enormous wall of World War I ordnance, and then you entered the trench system. Over the years that I came here, gradually he improved upon it. When I came here in the summer of 1986 with my parents, he just lined all the trenches with timber, put brand new duck boarding down, had managed to find some German concrete bunkers elsewhere and bring them into the woods to turn them into observation posts. And his new trench museum was about to open when, sadly, André Becker died and this part of Ypres' history closed forever. At the time, he said the trenches were original and before trench maps were easily available or the linesman project that uses digital GPS reference trench maps so you can see where you are on the battlefield... It was easy to take such statements as face value, and we did. What I subsequently discovered is that he actually dug these trenches himself in the 1970s, just as he fancied. Easy access from his cafe, built them around the real, actual, original bunkers that were in the wood itself, but what was here was not a true representation of the trench system that existed during the Great War. He was a great storyteller. He loved to tell tales and one of them was about Hitler. He often remarked that if only the Germans had won the war, then this would have been a shrine. But that wasn't his story. His story was this. One night, Hitler was in the wood. He'd been wounded, and he was laying on a stretcher in one of the bunkers, just as the British raided the German trenches that night. A young British officer jumped down into the trench, made his way up, pistol in hand, and saw a bunker with a gas blanket over the door. He pulled that blanket back, stepped into the bunker, pistol at the ready, and saw the pathetic figure of Hitler lying wounded on the stretcher. He levelled the pistol, was about to pull the trigger and fire, when he paused and said, Oh, I won't shoot you. You'll do no harm. Well, a great story. But of course Hitler never faced the British here. There were no British trench raids for them to encounter Hitler in a bunker. The bunkers date from after Hitler was in this sector, and he was never wounded here either. So while it made a great story, and one that I often tell when I come here, it bears no resemblance to the truth, just like the trench system that was once here. The bunkers, though, were original, 
and there was an entrance to a mine shaft with a little bucket seat where you could be winched down the shaft and your legs dangled above the water beneath, something that I suspect modern health and safety would not allow. So the trenches and the museum was a fake, but nevertheless it gave an insight into the war, a representation of the war, and one to the many thousands of people I think who came here was a lasting impression that stayed with them, just as it stayed with me. After Beccar's death, the wood remained unused for quite some time. His dug trenches collapsed and faded away. And then in the 1990s, with growing interest in the Great War, a group of archaeologists moved in and a proper examination of the site was made. There's a fantastic Flemish book about this called Bayenvelt. They excavated the site, they used experimental archaeology to reconstruct the trenches, air photos and trench maps to plot them. And what we have here now, which you visit by getting a ticket from the Kemmel Tourist Office and then going through a turnstile a little bit further up the wood, you go in and you have a proper representation of what was here. The trenches in this part of the wood were not the front line. The front line was out in the field just to the left of the wood. These are the second line positions. So we see here a mix of support trenches and communication trenches entrances to the German mine shafts. The Germans were tunnelling under our positions just as we were tunnelling under theirs. At the rear of the modern building it's been landscaped now but there is the remains of a mine crater there that's shown on British trench maps as early as 1916 so one presumes that this is a crater either from the French tunnelling operations here or from work by Royal Engineer tunnelling companies later in the conflict. What Bayenvelt does now, particularly for adult and school groups that come here is give them a good representation of a trench system in comparison to what they've seen at Sanctuary Wood. So at Sanctuary Wood they've seen a British support line trench system used by British and Commonwealth troops and here at Bayenvelt they can see a, a German support line system used by German troops up until these positions were captured in the Battle of Messines in 1917. Today we can walk through the leafy glade of Krunart Wood and get a much clearer and historically accurate idea of how the trenches operated on this part of the Messines Ridge, what they looked like, the materials that were used to construct them and keep them stable and safe for the troops within. But there's something within me that to a degree harks back to the days of André Beccar, the rough and ready Great War history that was once here, the artefacts, the tangible side of the Great War, which sometimes feels that it can be missing from certain sites on the Western Front. But this is a place that should be on your list when you come to Flanders to get a sense of the experience on the other side of no man's land, life on the other side of the wire, to get a rounder picture of the overall experience of soldiers here in Flanders during the Great War. While Hitler's unit moved on, other Bavarian soldiers served in this sector right up until the Battle of Messines in 1917. And at some point in 1916 they published a rather nice book of sketches from this part of the battlefield. And there are several that were done in Krunart Wood, and I'll put these on the podcast website. Looking at them and visiting the trenches, we see the wattle and daub style trench revetments, the supports that held the trench up. Rather than regulated duck boards, we see long planks of wood that acts as the flooring of the trench that the men walk on. Beneath that, a drainage ditch. In 2012, I was lucky to see original examples of that, not here. But at Messines, dug by the excellent battlefield conflict archaeologist Simon Verdigam. I have been here with people who doubt the construction of the trenches that we see, that it's as if in the 1990s the archaeologists just made up the design in the same way that Beccar had done with his trench museum. But I'm able to show them the pictures from the Messines dig and how actually this accurately represents the type of trenches that were here during the war. We think of our own troops spending long periods in the front line, but British units moved up and down the Western Front on a regular basis, from Ypres to Arras, down to the Somme, back up to Ypres, maybe near Armentiers or Richbourg. The Germans tended to keep their men in one sector for a very long time, and although they had regular periods of rest, they would know these trenches intimately. And I think of the German soldiers from Bavaria who spent all those years here, from the formation of this trench system in 1914 until the Battle of Messines that pushed them back in 1917. They dreamt of home, the Bavarian hills, the snow in winter, 
the cattle in the fields. Flanders must have seemed a very different landscape to them. And when you travel round Bavaria today and go into some of the small churches in the tiniest villages, you often come across a war memorial with lists of names and in the church itself, a frame containing photographs of the men from that village who died. And I often wonder how many faces in those churches that I've visited over the years are men who once walked in Krunart Wood or here on the Messines Ridge around Witcharter. And with thoughts of them, we'll leave Krunart Wood, retrace our steps to the road and walk back to the French memorial. When the French were here in 1914, they called it not Krunart Wood or Bayenwald, but Bois 40, Wood 40. And this memorial commemorates one of the units that passed through this sector at that time and one of its officers, Lieutenant Paul-Marie Lasnier of the 1er Battalion Chasseur à Pied, French Light Infantry. He was a 31-year-old officer who was from Brignol in Navarre. He'd been at the front since the start of the war and had taken part in several engagements with his regiment. His unit was holding this wooded area on the ridge, and on the 2nd of November 1914, they came under continuous shell fire from the Germans. Lasnier was killed by one of these shell blasts. He was originally buried here, and his family had this monument placed on the site of his grave, but his burial site was actually moved across the border into France, and he now rests in a soldier's grave at the French National Cemetery at Notre Dame de Lorette near Arras. We'll continue down the path alongside the Lasnier Memorial and that will take us to Krunart Chapel Cemetery. This is a small battlefield cemetery of just 74 graves. It was started by units of the 19th Western Division who came up the slopes that you've walked in the attack on the scenes in June 1917 and buried some of their dead here, including some men of the Cheshire Regiment who attacked across the ground just to the right of the cemetery. Later on, it sits in a bit of a hollow protected by the ridge so there were gun sites here first field artillery and then heavier guns from the royal garrison artillery and the change in burials here reflects that with many gunners graves found amongst them post-war a soldier of the chinese labor corps was buried here there's no record of how he died many men of the chinese labor corps succumbed to influenza of spanish flu but the fact that he's buried here on the battlefield possibly indicates that he died in the post-war clearance as they went across this ground, disposing of the ordnance, burying material in shell holes and recovering the dead. It was a grim task, but often a dangerous task as well, and quite a lot of men from the Chinese Labour Corps were both killed and injured during this post-war clearance period. Perhaps he was one of them. As we stand here and look across the plush Flanders landscape, over to our right is Kemmel Hill, where we've walked in another podcast. We're in the southern sector of Flanders, the Messines Ridge ahead of us, stretching out across this southern part of the Ypres salient, the old battlefields of Flanders. In the spring, the birds dart and fly across these fields, high in the cool breeze above the cemetery. In the summer, the tractors harvest the crops around the cemetery as you stand here and reflect. The old world has gone, but occasionally we hear echoes whether that's of the men of the generation of the Great War, the Meister, André Beccar and his trench museum, or the gentle footsteps of the past that echo across the old front line. You've been listening to an episode of The Old Front Line with me, military historian Paul Reed. Do take time to subscribe to us via your favourite podcast service. Tell us what you think using the hashtag Old Frontline. You can follow me on Twitter at Somcore, and the podcast has its own Twitter feed now at Old Frontline Pod. And have a look at the podcast website, oldfrontline.co.uk. Until we meet again along the Old Frontline. <laughs>